So this lecture will go over a little bit of the background and review some of the concepts that we've covered up to this point in terms of the history of navigation and how early navigation was done. Then we'll go into a brief history of GPS systems as a whole. And then from that, that'll segue into a history of the GPS satellites and the different generations and what that means for the accuracy and how the entire system works as a whole. Following that, we'll go into more detail about how the GPS system as a whole works, what are the different segments of it, and following that, get into a little bit even greater detail about how some of the satellite generated signals work and what that means for determining your position. So the first few slides of this lecture are meant to provide some brief background or review that may be useful for the lecture. So navigation requires the use of our senses, landmarks, and navigation aids. So some historical navigation aids, such as the astrolabe, the sextant, and the clock, um, as well as the radio navigation aids, GNSS systems are space-based systems largely, and GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System, or systems. So the U.S. version of GNSS is the Navstar Positioning System. Uh, it's commonly referred to as GPS. Now, there are other GNSS systems operated by other nations and organizations. Some of these that we'll cover later in the class are Galileo, which is actually run by the European Union. GLONASS is run by the Russians and Beidou, also known as Compass, is run by the Chinese. And then QZSS is a quasi-Zenith system. It's more regional, similar to WAS, which we'll get into later. But we'll cover those later. So the majority of what we'll focus on right now is the Navstar, or the US program, also just known as G GPS. So just remember that geodesy is the science and art of point positioning. So in that there are three surfaces essential to geodesy. They are the ellipsoid, the geoid, and the true topographic surface, or the Earth's surface. So since the Earth isn't a perfect sphere, it's modeled commonly as a very simplified biaxial ellipsoid. This is also called an oblate spheroid, but for the purposes of this class, we'll ask you to just refer to it as a biaxial ellipsoid. Now, all this is saying is that it's flattened at the poles, so there's a semi-major and semi-minor axes. Remember that these ellipsoids are mathematically smooth. They're very simplified surface of the Earth. A little bit more complex than that is the geoid, which, remember, is an equigravitational surface. It's a little bit more complex, a little bit more closely mirrors Earth's true shape. It's also, the geoid is an approximation of global mean sea level. And then we have the true topographic surface, which is the most complex and toughest to model. So a horizontal datum is, remember, a biaxial ellipsoid that has a well-defined origin and axis of orientation. So in this class, and actually in general, the most common horizontal datum that you'll come across is WGS-84. WGS is World Geodetic System, 84, it was developed in 1984. So it's a standard detailed model of Earth's gravitational irregularities, in other words, and it's, it's an ellipsoid. Now there's some areas where the ellipsoid is above and some areas where it's below the geoid surface. You can see that mapped out here where you see some areas it's well, the geoid is well below the ellipsoid, other areas the geoid is actually above the ellipsoid. Remember that's because the ellipsoid is a mathematically smooth surface, geoid is going to vary depending on the gravitational potential at any given point. Remember that latitude is actually an angular measure, so latitude is an angle reference to the equator which runs from east to west around the earth. Longitude is the angle reference to some meridian and that meridian runs from north to south or around the Earth. And then the height is actually a distance from some reference plane to the point being measured. Now, it's important to keep in mind that latitude and longitudes are both angular measures and that height is actually a distance measurement. A common coordinate system is UTM, or Universal Transverse Mercator. 
So here's an example of a complete UTM location. Remember, you need all the information provided here in order to completely and accurately position yourself within the UTM grid and on the Earth. If you need more information about how to read this, I would refer you to the previous lecture, Lecture 2, which dealt with detailed information about how to read UTM coordinates. So a reminder, now that we've covered horizontal datums, a vertical datum is a reference surface constituted of points with known heights either above or below mean sea level, and that's determined by a tidal gauge near the coast or the shape of the geoid away from the coast. So the originally accepted vertical datum was NGVD 29, composed of 26 benchmarks, derived in 1929, but it couldn't resolve local and regional differences in mean sea level and it also couldn't account for any drift due to plate tectonics. Remember that was updated in 1988 with NAVD 88, which stands for North American Vertical Datum of 1988, in which all elevations are given as the orthometric height relative to the local geoid surface or global mean sea level. So GPS units natively measure ellipsoidal height or ellipsoid height, and then they correct for geoid height to get the orthometric height. So the focus of this lecture will be to provide you with a fundamental understanding of how GNSS and GPS systems work. At the most simplified level, GPS is simply a constellation of satellites that orbit the Earth at approximately altitude of 20,200 kilometers. And these satellites transmit radio waves to receivers all across the planet. So to give you an idea of where this lies in relation to other systems, airplanes tend to fly about 10 kilometers high. The shuttle orbits at about 370 kilometers in altitude. It's also important to note that there's no limit to the number of receivers that use this system because there's no signal sent back from the receivers to the satellite. So you may be wondering how we're able to have so many different systems up at a single time, orbiting the Earth at a single time, without any collisions. Well, each GNSS or system operates at a very precise altitude, which is dictated by international space law. So this diagram shows that the orbit altitude of the US GPS system, also called Navstar, is different than that of the European Union system called Galileo, which is different than the Beidou 2, otherwise known as Compass system, which is a Chinese system, which is different than the GLONASS system, which is the Russian system. So what we'll cover is the US system. However, as you'll see, a lot of what we cover here is also transferable or similar, has similarities to other systems. So the first artificial satellite was called Sputnik 1, which was launched in 1959, transmitted a signal which was monitored by the Applied Physics Lab at John Hopkins University, and that signal exhibited a Doppler shift as a result of the relative satellite motion. Now, if the exact location of the satellite was known, then the observer, based on that Doppler shift, could be located on Earth. So the first prototype GPS satellite based on that was launched in 1958, known as the transit system. So the transit system reached full operational capability in 1964, and then the Timation satellite was launched by the Naval Research Lab, or NRL, to prove that we could, we could place accurate clocks in space. So the GPS system that we know today was initially developed by the Department of Defense in the early 1970s. Now this system was developed as a military system designed to precisely target enemies. So it was initially developed as a defense navigation satellite system, but would eventually evolve into the USNO NAVSTAR, or just NAVSTAR for short, GPS system. NAVSTAR stands for Navigation Satellite with Time and Ranging. So initially this was restricted to military and government users, so it was opened up to a civilian use and a broader market, after a Korean Airlines flight 007 was straight into USSR prohibited airspace and was shot in 1983. So this system reached its initial operational capability or IOC in 1993, which consisted of 24 satellites. 
and then it reached its full operational cap capability, which is a FOC in 1995. And that's actually greater than 24 satellites. So there were some satellites put up as backups. So the current constellation configuration is known as an ex expandable 24 configuration. This was implemented in 2011, and it actually consists of 27 satellites or more at any given point. So it's kind of a misnomer. It's called expandable 24, but it actually consists of 27 or more satellites. So now we're going to go into a brief discussion of the different GPS satellite generations. And there's a lot of information thrown in here. Take away how satellites have improved and generally what the different capabilities or capabilities that have been added to or removed to each satellite generation are. So the first satellite generation is known as a Block 1 satellites. Now these were primarily built for experimental purposes. They require ground support every 14 days to update position. So they were fairly manually intensive to monitor and to update. They were all taken out of service by 1995 and they were replaced actually by the Block 2 and 2A satellites. So there's 28 satellites that were launched between 1989 and 1997 and the big takeaway for the Block 2 and 2A satellites is that they require ground support every 180 days. Now this is much, much longer than the 14 days from the Block 1 satellites, which means they're a little bit more autonomous. They're not as manually intensive. The other important thing to note with the Block 2 and 2A satellites is that they included a selective availability and anti-spoofing technology. We'll cover what that is later in the course, but the biggest takeaway there is that was meant to limit the accessibility or the precision of accuracy that a general user could get versus a military or government author authorized user. So the Block 2 and 2A satellites required ma less manual updating. They also were meant to last 7.5 years. Now there's still some in service today, so they've vastly outgrown that lifespan. Now there's the improvement from the Block 2 and 2A satellites is the Block 2R and 2RM satellites. There were 21 of these commissioned, one lost during failure. Once again, similar to the previous generation, they require ground contact approximately 180 days. However, they also contain 210 days of predicted satellite orbit. So what that means is they can maintain that autonomous operation without ground contact at precisely 180 days. So they were meant once again to last approximately seven and a half to eight and a half years. And they're still in use today. So they've once again outgrown that and they've continued to be operational, at least to some degree. So the biggest improvement with this generation though, is that it contains stronger antennas for both civilian and military signals. So you still have that selective availability and anti-spoofing technology there. The only difference is you have stronger antennas for the signals to be transmitted with. The next generation of improvement is the Block 2F satellites. And there were 33 satellites commissioned beginning in 2010, actually. And the biggest improvement with these is that they were meant to replace the Block 2R and 2RM and previous generation of satellites. They have a longer lifespan and they have an even stronger autonomous position accuracy. So they're a little bit more autonomous, don't require as much updating. And then the modernized, first generation of modernized satellites is the GPS-3. Now these were expected to begin launching in 2016 and they will provide GPS or the goal is for them to provide GPS until 2030. Now the biggest improvement in the GPS-3 is that they're expected to have submeter accuracy. Now this is an incredible improvement over any of the previous generations and it all has to do with the accuracy of the clocks and the, and the stronger antennas. So also important to know about the GPS-3, the modernized satellites, is that they're built without selective availability at all. So it's not possible, given the GPS-3 satellites, to 
intentionally manipulate the position of a given satellite and thereby throw off the air, throw off the positioning of a user. So the other addition or improvement, I should say, is that they had a 15 year lifespan. So they're built once again for a little bit longer. So the current constellation, as I said previously, is called Expandable 24. It actually consists of 27 or more satellites. Now, because the exact number of satellites operational within each generation is going to vary from time to time, I'm going to refer you to the external satellite generation slide, which has this updated information about how many satellites of each generation are still in operation or are still active today. So the biggest improvement, though, in terms of positioning comes with the clock types. So we mentioned that the different generations have different accuracies and different capabilities. Well, throughout the different generations, they've gradually improved the clocks. And you don't have to know how many atomic clocks or cesium clocks or rubidium clocks or any of that. Just know that the biggest improvement or one of the big improvements was the ability to more accurately and precisely measure time. So because as we'll get to later, clock accuracy is really important. It's essential to identifying precisely and accurately your location on the Earth. Improving the satellite clocks represents a significant advancement. So now we're going to go into how GPS works and get into the three different components or segments and how each of those interacts. And a lot of what we'll cover here is similar to other systems such as Galileo and GLONASS and COMPASS and Beidou 2, but it's, there might be subtle differences between those other systems. So at its simplest level, GPS consists of three main components or segments. And you need to know these. So the first segment is the control segment. This is responsible for maintaining the orbit and clock timing, as well as updating the constellation Almanac and Ephemeris, as we'll touch on in the next few slides. So that control segment monitors and updates the space segment. The space segment is a constellation of satellites so that at least four are visible anywhere on the Earth. And then these space, these constellation of satellites, actually transmit the signals, which once again, remember, are maintained and updated by the control segment. So it the space segment transmits those signals which are received by the users, or that's, in other words, you with your re GPS receiver unit. And at the user end, the user hardware and accuracy of position is determined by the ability of that hardware to accurately and very precisely measure time. Everything relies on timing in this class. So to reiterate, the three main segments that you need to know are control, space, and the user segment. So we'll start actually with the GPS space segment. So the space segment is once again an expandable 24 configuration, consists of a constellation of 27 or more satellites. And these satellites orbit the Earth at approximately 3.9 kilometers per second. Now, that means they orbit the Earth at approximately 12 sidereal hours, or more precisely, 11 hours, 58 minutes. So they orbit the Earth a little bit faster than 12 hours. What this means is that the same satellite reaches a given position approximately four minutes earlier each day. And this is something that you have to account for. So this, that's the responsibility of the control segment. So, but the satellites themselves, the constellation, is arranged in six different planes. These planes are inclined at about 55 degrees towards the equator, and they're rotated by 60 degrees against each other. And so there's, there's four or more satellites per plane. Remember, we have 27 satellites, six planes. Do the math, we have four or more satellites per plane. So, and with the U.S. system, the satellites orbit the Earth between 55 degrees north and 55 degrees south latitude. Now, what this means is that you're more likely to have more satellites between those latitudes. Other systems, as we'll show later, 
operate in different latitude bands. This just depends on the system and the specifications of the system. So as I said, the space segment is updated and maintained by the control segment. So the control segment is a series of master control and monitoring stations around the world actually that monitor the position of the satellites, the health of the satellites, and the health of the satellite signals that they transmit. So all this is the responsibility of the master control station. The master control station for the US system, for the Navstar system, is located in Colorado or near Colorado Springs. And what this control segment does is it's responsible for monitoring and then updating the almanac or the future projected positions of all the satellites and the ephemeris or the present position of all the satellites such a way that it reduces error that accumulates through time. Remember, the satellites orbit the Earth a little bit faster than 12 hours per orbit, which means that you need to account for that. That error can build up very quickly. So as I said, satellite navigation in the GPS system as a whole works based on timing. Timing is essential to be able to accurately and precisely measure the time and time differences will determine the accuracy of your GPS. So time of arrival or TOA is a way that we calculate our distance from any particular satellite. So TOA ranging is done by measuring the time it takes for a signal transmitted by an emitter, in this case a satellite, GPS satellite, at a known location to reach a user's receiver. So you take the time that it takes for the signal to go from the satellite to the receiver. You multiply that then by the speed at which that signal travels. So in the case of satellite GPS signals, the signal propagation time is multiplied by the speed of the signal, which is the speed of light, which then you get the distance between the satellite and the receiver. So by doing this for a series of satellites throughout the constellation, you can get your distance from each and then triangulate your location. So if we take the example of a ship at sea, consider that you are lost at sea or you're a mariner trying to determine where you are relative to the rocky coast. So you don't want to run ashore to run ashore to run into a shoal or a rocky outcrop would spell disaster. So assume that you have a clock on board which is synchronized with a foghorn somewhere on land. Now the foghorn blows every minute on the minute. So what you can do is calculate the time difference from when the signal or when that foghorn blows to when that sound gets to you and multiply that time difference by the speed of sound to get an approximate distance from the ship or from we, where you are to the foghorn. So if we take the example here and say it takes 15 seconds for that signal to go from the foghorn to you and multiply that by a velocity of 335 meters per second, we get a distance of approximately 5,025 meters. The problem with this is which way do you go? You just know that you're within some radius from that foghorn. You don't have any sense of direction yet. So if we take the example here, say you are at the, you're somewhere on the perimeter or on the dashed line and the foghorn is the red dot. So you only know that you're somewhere on that black dashed line. You don't know very precisely or accurately where you are with just one signal. So now consider that you have two foghorns that blow regularly. So you know when one foghorn blows, you know when the other blows by repeating the process for both of those. Now you're 15 seconds from the first foghorn and you're five seconds from the second foghorn. What that tells you in this instance is that you're one of two possible locations. So we're one of the two blue circles on the diagram here. So if we take the example here, looking, trying to ground it a little bit more in reality. So foghorn one is on land, foghorn two is located offshore. You know your propagation time. You know how fast that, that signal is transmitted. You can calculate your position to one of two locations. But still, it's important to know which of these locations you're at. 
you could be at one and be really close to a rocky outcrop. You could be at, or a sandy shoal, or you could be at another and be in some safer waters. So which one you're at really matters. And you're only going to get that by adding a third signal transmitting location. So it's a third foghorn in this case. So if you have a third one, you eliminate one of those two options and more accurately and precisely determine your position relative to those three foghorns. So the previous example assumed that the vessel's clock or your clock was very precisely and accurately synchronized with a foghorn's clock. However, this isn't always the case. So if your ship's clock is off by even one second, then the ship has a positional error of approximately 335 meters. Now that's from each foghorn. So it's important that you know very precisely what the time difference it is or how long it takes for that signal to propagate from the transmitter or from the foghorn to you, the receiver. So in this case, if we assume that we that there is some degree of positioning error, timing error, we could be at either the blue or the yellow circle. And it, that's why it's important for us to know very precisely how accurate the clock is. So in reality, the time of arrival measurements wouldn't be perfect. Now there's a whole variety of different reasons for that. The atmosphere affects the satellite signal propagation. So changes in humidity, air pressure, even the ionic interference is going to affect that signal propagation. There's a foghorn clock offset, or in this case, or in the case of GPS, that's the satellite clock offset which once again we have to account for. And then there's the time base for the clock, for the foghorn. Now there's also other interfering sounds, interfering signals that are being transmitted at the same time and you need to be able to filter those out. And those also affect the propagation time. So instead of having a single point and an intersection, there's actually a triangular error space. So there's a possible area that you could be now we're going to get into a little bit more detail about the satellite generated signals themselves and what that means for your position. So based on the time of arrival for multiple satellites, you're able to determine your 3D position. So you're able to get a distance from each of the satellites and triangulate your location. Now this assumes that the satellite locations or the ephemeris is very precisely known. As mentioned earlier, there's several things that can affect the ephemeris and the almanac of satellites, and we'll cover that a little bit more later. But once again, remember TOA, time of arrival, assumes that satellite positions are precisely known. So we said that satellite or radio signals travel at the speed of light, so 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So the ranging signal is emitted by the satellite, which is timed by an accurate onboard clock. Now remember those clocks have improved over generations to be increasingly precise and accurate. So the user receiver also contains a clock that's synchronized to that same time system. So it's synchronized to the same time system as the onboard satellite clocks. So the timing information embedded in the satellite ranging signal enables the receiver to calculate when the signal left the satellite, which then you can calculate the time difference or the propagation time it takes for that satellite signal to go from the satellite to the receiver. So GPS satellites have very, very precise and accurate clocks that tell time to within 40 nanoseconds, and this is constantly improving this accuracy and precision. So to give you an idea of what that means in terms of GPS, in terms of real world, if you have a mismatch between a satellite and a receiver clock by even one millionth of a second, so a very minuscule, very, very small time measurement, you get an error, a positioning error of 120 meters. So it's important that you can very, very precisely estimate or calculate the time it takes for that signal to, to propagate. Now you match up and you calculate the time difference based on a pseudo random noise code or a PRN code. 
So the receiver and the satellite, because they're synced to the same time system, generate the same PRN code at exactly the same time. Now what this does is it allows the receiver to calculate the time difference from when the code was transmitted by the satellite to when the code arrives to the receiver. And this time difference is compared to the same code generated by the receiver, which is why you're able to calculate that time difference. So here's a graphical representation of it. So the result of the propagation time multiplied by the speed of light, or the, the speed at which that signal is transmitting, yields that satellite to user range. So in this case, the user would be located somewhere on the surface of a sphere around the satellite. Now that could be any direction. There's no indication of direction using a single satellite. So this is a 3D representation of it or a pseudo 3D representation where based on that time difference or that propagation time in the product of that multiplied by the speed of the signal, you can get your distance in, on some sphere relative to that satellite. Now, with two satellites, the user can be located somewhere on the perimeter of where the spheres overlap. So just where the two spheres touch. So you calculate the time difference from one satellite to your location and the time difference from another satellite to your location. And you can narrow your location down to some perimeter where those two spheres overlap. So in other words, this is the outer edges of the plane of intersection. So here's a 2D representation of it. It's more accurate to think of it in a 3D representation where you could be somewhere on that white line. Now with three satellites, the user can be located at one of two points. Now this is where all three spheres intersect. You may have you may be thinking about this in a traditional 2D environment, such as the version on the right here, where in two dimensions, yes, you eliminate your position down to one possible location. However, if you think about it in a 3D environment, you actually narrow your location down to two possible points. And this is where all three spheres intersect. So if we look at it in three dimensions, now that we add a third satellite here in blue, we can tell that we're at one of the two white dots. So there's one close or on the Earth's surface and then there's one up above the Earth. However, which one are you at? Now, if you're on the surface of the Earth, you can automatically eliminate the upper point and you must be at the lower point or you must be at the point that more closely aligns with the geoid and ellipsoid. However, if you're potential to be a spaceborne or airborne user, then you can be above or below that plane. Now, in that case, you need some additional or auxiliary information about where your location is. Now, that auxiliary information comes from a fourth satellite, which is used to adjust for receiver clock error and used to calculate the correct receiver position. So in other words, to sum it up, by adding that fourth receiver, you're able to eliminate one of your two possible points and more accurately and precisely determine which of those two you're at. So a general rule of thumb now is that the more satellites you can pick up and receive the signals for, the greater accuracy your unit. Now that also has some hardware limitations based on how accurately your, in, your GPS receiver can calculate and measure that time difference. So as we'll cover later in the courses, different generations or different levels of GPS receivers will enable to, you to more accurately or less accurately calculate your location. But once again, that's based on the internal capabilities or the timing capabilities of the hardware itself. So to sum it up in terms of your positioning relative to satellites, if you have one satellite, you can determine your location within along some sphere, some surface. If you have two satellites, you limit that to some line where those two spheres intersect, some circular area. If you have three satellites, you then further limit that area down to two possible points, which you can then determine which one of those two you're at using the fourth satellite. So it's important that you can pick up more satellites to improve your accuracy of your position.
that does it for this lecture. Hopefully you have a better understanding of the history of GPS, how GPS operates, what are the three main segments or components of the GPS system as a whole, and then how do you determine your position relative to the satellite constellation at a very simple level. So no time of arrival and how you calculate your time of arrival using your PRN codes.